Shalom. Today we are returning to the Chamesh Megillot, the fifth of the scrolls, which is Kohelet, which is translated as Ecclesiastes. Previously we have discussed how the five scrolls line up with the five books of Moses, and we see that Ecclesiastes will line up with Deuteronomy. Both Ecclesiastes and Deuteronomy are retrospectives. There is some question about whether Solomon really wrote Ecclesiastes, but in any event, it is reflective of his life and the things that he went through in his life, and he's looking back on his life. Deuteronomy is Moses' reflection back on of the 40 years he spent with the children of Israel in the wilderness. Both books are read at Sukkot. Traditionally, the end of Deuteronomy is read on Simchat Torah, which is a non-biblical holiday celebrated by most Jewish congregations the day after Shemini Atzeret. Moses commanded them to read the Book of the Law during this festival, Deuteronomy 31.10. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before Yahweh thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. We also see in Nehemiah's day that they were practicing this reading from Nehemiah 8:18. 8, also day by day, from the first day unto the last, he read in the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. So that solemn assembly is Shemini Atzeret. The reading of Ecclesiastes at Sukkot is a much later development, maybe the 11th or 13th century. Partially the rabbis installed this tradition that the people would remember what it means to live in Sukkot, in tabernacles, that life is transitory. They were afraid that there would be too much reveling during the holiday, and so they added it to remind the people of the solemnity. They rely on uh, two verses from 1 Kings 8, 2, And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month of Etanim, which is the seventh month. In other words, they're assembled for the holiday of Sukkot, and so it is a legend that Solomon had written this book, and he read it to them during that time. They also rely on Ecclesiastes 11.2, Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth, saying that the holiday itself of Sukkot is seven days, but then there is also the eighth day. So uh, it's a little flimsy reasoning, but that's how they came about. They did. The theme of Ecclesiastes is vanity of vanities, which in Hebrew is haval havalim. And we see that this word havel means vanity, and it also is Abel's name. Not that anything that Abel did was in vain or that his life was vain, but the two ideas are collect, uh, connected because Abel's name havel means a puff of air or a puff of wind. Here are the Definitions of vanity according to the Webster's 1828 dictionary. And so we see like, like a puff of wind is just emptiness, there's nothing there. The behavior of people when they do vain things or useless things. Part of it is, yes, checking yourself out and looking really great in the mirror or whatever. But there are many other things which are fruitless, they are emptiness to do, and these are the things that are referred to in Ecclesiastes. The word Havalim appears once in Deuteronomy 32.21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So particularly Deuteronomy 32 is Moses' retrospective on uh, what has happened to the people and what will happen to the people in terms of their obedience to God. Paul refers to these this thought in Romans, both chapters 10 and 11, 
We know that Romans chapters 9 through 11 are about the olive tree, Gentiles being grafted into the olive tree in 1019. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. So Paul is relating the series of events of how the Gentiles will be grafted in. And then again in Romans 11:11, 11, 11, I say then, had they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Interestingly, both books have a very similar conclusions. Deuteronomy 32, 46. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing, it's not an empty or useless, frivolous thing for you, because it is your life, and through this thing you shall prolong your days in the land, whether you go over the Jordan to possess it. Similarly, at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon relates, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. One of the little side trail that I would like to pursue in this presentation is if it crossed Solomon's mind that perhaps he was the, the promised Messiah. He didn't have a lot of information about who the Messiah was. He didn't have a well-developed concept about what the Messiah would accomplish. This comes much later in time. But there are a few hints from Numbers 24, 16 through 19, while Balaam is prophesying. He hath said, which heard the words of God, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty. I see him, but not now. I should behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And he shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. And it appears that Solomon would fit that bill. In Deuteronomy 18, 18, there is another prophecy. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, that is like unto Moses, and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. In fact, in the Talmud, the rabbis say that Solomon wanted to be a second Moses. And they rely on this verse. We're going to look at one moment um, in Tractate Rosh Hashanah 21b. From this verse in Ecclesiastes 12.10, the preacher, Kohelet, sought to find out acceptable words. And that, which was, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. So this is their comment on that. One said, and in other words, one rabbi is speaking. Fifty gates of understanding were created in the world, and all were given to Moses, save one. As it says, yet thou hast made him but little lower than God. So that they're quoting the scripture and saying, Moses received fifty of these, uh, 49 of these revelations. Why? Because he was made a little lower than God. Now Kohelet, that is the preacher, Ecclesiastes, taught to find out words of delight. This is what we were just speaking about, the acceptable words. That is to say, Kohelet sought to be like Moses, but a bat kol went forth. A bat kol uh, literally is a daughter of the voice, and it means a voice from heaven. The voice from heaven said to him, It is not written uprightly even words of truth. There arose not a prophet again in Israel like Moses, quoting Deuteronomy 34.10. The other said, now another rabbi is going to make a comment on the same idea. Among the prophets there arose not, but among the kings there did arise. So he's saying, yes, Solomon was like Moses. How then do I interpret the words Kohelet sought to find out words of, of delight? Kohelet sought to pronounce verdicts from his own insight without witnesses and without warning. warning. Whereupon a bat kol, a voice from heaven, went forth and said, 
It is written uprightly, even the words of truth, at the mouth of two witnesses, etc., quoting Deuteronomy 19. So in the end, they both come to the conclusion that possibly Solomon was not that person like Moses, but the idea that he sought to find those words of the 50 gates of understanding, the one that was not given to Moses, he was looking for that one. And so he considered himself to be like Moses, trying to fulfill that prophecy. The other evidence that Solomon would have had would have been all the scriptures referring to the promises to the son of David. In 2 Samuel 7, 12, 16, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. And thine house, speaking of David, and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And so Solomon, knowing that he's David's son, he's going to inherit these promises. From Psalm 2, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Yahweh hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And we know that Solomon conquered the most land that was ever in possession by the Israel people. From Psalm 89, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Again, as a repeat, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of iron, and with the stripes of the children of men. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, Thy throne shall be established forever. From First Chronicles 22 Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon, Shlomo, which comes from the word for peace. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. From First Chronicles 28, And of all my sons, for Yahweh hath given me many sons, this is David speaking, he hath chosen Solomon my son to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Yahweh over Israel. And from Psalm 132, If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony, that I shall teach them, their children shall sit upon thy throne forevermore. So this is about all the evidence that Solomon would have that he would be uh, the all. Of course, all the kings are anointed. They are all Mashiach because that is the word for anointed. But he is the son of David who is inheriting this throne forever. Now Solomon himself wrote a psalm which is considered to be a messianic psalm. At the end of this psalm, it says this thus concludes the psalms of David. So perhaps. This was a prayer of David, and Solomon recorded it, and it became a psalm attributed to him. Give the king thy judgments, O God, for thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy, he shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and the isle shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. And we know that the queen of Sheba did come and offer him gifts. 
Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, and the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountain. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All the nations will call him blessed. Blessed be Yahweh God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Now I've highlighted this uh, words here in verse 17 shall be continued. And we see in the Hebrew, Yehi Shemoli Alam Lefnei Shemesh Yinon Shmo. This is what is translated as his name shall be continued. There's also a comment uh, in the Talmud in Psalm 198b where they declare, they're talking, discussing about the different names that Messiah might have and what guises he might have come in. And the school of Rabbi Yanai said, his name is Yinon, for it is written, his name shall endure forever. Ere the sun was, his name is Yinon. So again, we see this messianic hint coming into the psalm that is supposedly written by Solomon. If Solomon thought to compare himself to Moses or to whatever their concept of a coming anointed one was, uh, he has this evidence on his side. And it's very clear from his biography, as it appears in other places throughout the Bible, that he started off very well. But we know that he didn't finish so well. When we compare Moses and Solomon, we see that they were both raised in the palace and they were both leaders of the people. Solomon spoke a lot about eating and drinking, but then we know Moses went up on the mountain and fasted for 40 days twice. Both of them led the people for 40 years, but Moses lived to be 120 and Solomon only lived to be 60, just half as long. They were both familiar with the Torah as written Deuteronomy 31. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, sons of Levi, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, and unto all the elders of Israel. Solomon was required, being the king, to write a copy of Torah as commanded in Deuteronomy 17. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. The principal difference between Moses and Solomon is their attitude. In Numbers 12.3, we read that Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And we see how he dealt with the people of Israel and how he dealt with God, and yet he was a, remained a very, very humble man. On the other hand, we see that Solomon came to some destruction. We'll see that, talk about that in a minute. Proverbs 16, it is written, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so I think in all of his wealth and riches that Solomon became proud, and he lost that aspect of, of his position before a holy God. The word pride also is translated as arrogance. In Proverbs 8, the fear of Yahweh is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. But it also means majesty when it is applied to God. Job 40.10, deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. And also in Isaiah 2, 10, enter into the rock 
and hide thee in the dust for fear of Yahweh and for the glory of his majesty. A word which is translated both pride and majesty has the idea of being lifted up and being above. So when applied to God, yes, it is majesty. But when it comes to be applied to people, we see that it is pride and arrogance. So in the end, Solomon winds up fulfilling one of the prophecies of Moses in Deuteronomy 31.20. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and wax and fat, then they shall turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And we see that is exactly what happened uh, to Solomon in First Kings 11, starting in verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, and Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which Yahweh said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with Yahweh his God as was the heart of David, his father. So what is it that happened to Solomon that was different in his life and, and different in the life of Moses and even, let's say, Yeshua? What Solomon missed in his life was the wilderness experience. We know that the wilderness in Hebrew is the midbar. And when we spell the word midbar in Hebrew, it also can be read midaber. The, the wilderness is the place where God stripped the Israelites of their comforts and the things that they had brought out from Egypt. And it was there that he spoke to them. Solomon remained in his life surrounded by his comforts. And instead of running away from Egypt, he ran towards Egypt. He married Pharaoh's daughter, and aside from all the other women that he married, and this had bad effect on his behavior. He lost sight of Yahweh, his God. So now Sukkot is over. I hope you had a profitable time in the wilderness and that God spoke to you while you were out there. As always, Tasimita Inayim al Hashemayim. Keep your eyes on the skies. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.